first at this time. The rest of you folks, I want you to open up your Bible to the book of Judges. The book of Judges. I'm going to turn that down just a titch, brother. Book of Judges, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 11 through 16. This is part two of a message I began just before I went on vacation entitled, The People God Uses. The People God Uses. Now, beloved, I'm going to give you a brief overview of point number one. I can't go into everything that I I certainly taught you that time. You're going to have to get the uh, CDs uh, if you want to hear the fullness of the message. But I'll, I'll get you up to snuff and then we'll move on, okay? Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. And, of course, this is speaking about Gideon, the mighty man of valor. Beginning with verse 11, it says, There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, not Ophrah Winfrey, Ophrah in Israel, that pertained to Joash the Abazarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all this miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, beloved, what Gideon is saying here basically is this here, is we saw all these mighty miracles or heard of that our fathers uh, went through when you brought us out of the land of Egypt. But why are we in bondage to the Midianites right now if you're still with us? Why are you calling me a mighty man of valor? Verse 14, the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor of Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. I'm sure when God this to Gideon, his jaw must have dropped down a year. Because right now there was 145,000 Midianites arrayed against uh, Israel, and the biggest army that Gideon could raise was only 32,000 men. That's 450, to, excuse me, ended up with 300 men. That's 450 to one man. That's pretty bad odds, isn't it? Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we consider this subject today, we pray, Father, that your, present, your spirit would be present here, that you move in our hearts. And Lord God, you draw us ever so close, ever so nigh unto thee. Holy Spirit of the living God, I pray you move in the hearts and the minds of thy people. Help them be focused on the message. And Lord, help us to apply it to our lives. Father, I pray you'd anoint you with feet of clay in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. If you read in Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrews uh, uh, Heroes Hall of Faith and Fame chapter, beloved, you're going to be read about a reluctant Gideon. Gideon was called by God and by Israel a very valiant and gallant man. He was a hero in Israel. And yet the most impressive thing about Gideon was this, that he himself was not impressive in anything. He was just an ordinary guy. Gideon was not from an aristocratic family, but from one of the poorest families in all Israel. In other words, as we read the text, we see that he was but a simple herder. He was a farmer, beloved, the youngest son of a man named Joash in the line of Manasseh. And Manasseh was one of the smallest tribes that there was in Israel at that time. And he wasn't a professional soldier. He wasn't trained in military tactics or strategies or anything like that. He was just a young man who planted crops and tended flocks. And he wasn't this great, big, muscular, Herculean type of man, but by rather the testimony of his own mouth in verse 15, he says, I am the least, the least in my father's house. I'm the smallest, I'm the youngest, I'm not as strong as my brothers, I'm the least, he says, in my father's house. In other words, if you're going to call anybody, Lord, you need to call them, one of my family, one of my brothers, and not call me. Would you say amen out there? So in the vernacular of today, we could truly say that he was a nobody, that he was nothing special, that he wasn't impressive in size or looks. He wasn't impressive in his stature. He wasn't impressive, certainly, in his education. 
and he had very little training. And yet God used this ordinary man, like he wants to do with every one of us, to do extraordinary things. Beloved, hear me now. God takes nobodies, and God makes them somebodies. Would you say amen out there? Even though that somebody, some uh, professional football player or athlete or movie star, and they, they hit it big on the big screen, the silver screen, even though they may not know it, it's God himself that has allowed that in their life. Would you say amen? And someday they'll answer to God for it, and I hope that they can say amen and did what was right. I don't hold out much much hope for people in Hollywood, Hollywood uh, right now. Uh, beloved, he wasn't a very big man. He wasn't a very extraordinary man. But God says, Gideon, I'm going to call you, and not only are you going to defeat the Midianites, I'm going to make you a judge in Israel. And we know from the story, ladies and gentlemen, that Gideon ended up becoming one of the best judges Israel ever had, one of the best military leaders, one of the best political leaders. Under his leadership, after he defeated the Midianites, Israel experienced 40 years of peace and prosperity. Imagine that, even though they were surrounded by their enemies. This would happen in the Middle East if our generals and our people and our president would turn to God. God had undertake for him. He'd send his heavenly legions of angels. That's what I pray every day anyway. anyway. But we're all familiar with the story of Gideon, beloved, how the angel of the Lord... He called Gideon to amass an army to defeat and destroy the Amalekites and the Midianites. An army, beloved, think about it, 135,000, and you're the one God is calling to defeat them. You don't have a standing army in Israel. Everybody's hiding up in the rocks. In fact, the scripture says they planted their crops up in the rocks so these marauding bands of Amalekites and Midianites, when they would come into the land of Israel, they wouldn't take all their wheat, their crops, their grapes, all of their food. And so, beloved, it must have been staggering for Gideon to hear this, amen? But God said, Gideon, I want you to amass an army. So he did, and he ended up with 32,000 people. But God said, that's too many. I want you to have fewer people because what I don't want you to do is defeat the Midianites and then take all the glory and said you did it because of the military proudness and the power that you Israelites had. So I want you to reduce it down to 300, 300 of them. And you're going to defeat that 135,000 Midianite army and the glory is going to go to your God so they can know that there's a God in Israel, and they can repent and come to know him. Would you say amen out there? Because they know it would take a miracle for them to do that. So I'll tell you, 450 to 1 at that time, uh, those are terrible odds. You wouldn't want to gamble with that, would you? But God, nevertheless, gave that victory to Gideon, beloved, and this small band of 300 men. You know, principally speaking, this story shows us that God can do much with very little that God can make somebodies out of nobodies. Amen? As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that God uses the foolish things of the world, the base things of the world, the weak things of the world to confound those things that are mighty and that are wise. In other words, the so-called experts. Someone comes along who is not an expert, and yet through his wisdom that God has given him solves the problem. You want to talk about having egg on your face. Amen? But you see, God knows all things, and he's the God of all knowledge and God, uh, the God of all wisdom. And in verse 31 of 1 Corinthians, Paul concludes by saying this, that according as it is written, that uh, let him that glory, glory in the Lord. So if you want to glory about anything, God says everything that you have, every gift you have, every talent you have, everything you have in your life, know it or not, like it or not, you got it from me. I am the sovereign God, Lord God of heaven and earth. And every person in this room and watching by television is one heartbeat and one breath away from meeting this God. I've always told you, you better know what you're doing. You better know Jesus is your Lord and Savior because that's all he's going to ask you, not how good you were because you can't do anything better than what Jesus did. Amen. So, beloved, point number one was this I gave you when we last met. God uses common people. God uses common people. I want you to look at uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, Gideon, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now drop down to verses 15 and 16. 
And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am uh, the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You see, beloved, God didn't see Gideon as he was as a man in the flesh. God didn't see him as someone with his own natural inbred gifts and talents. But rather, God saw him how he would be, how he should be, how he could be when the Holy Spirit of the living God came upon him. Beloved, think about Samson. We talk about Samson, the military talks about Samson, and we all think Samson was a nine-foot man, muscular, whatever. He was just a little guy. And that's what dazzled the Philistines. They said, where does he get his strength from? He gets it from the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of God came upon him, he pulled up that fence, beloved, and he carried it 17 miles and put it on top of a hill, an iron fence, because of the strength that God had given him. And that's the strength that God has to regenerate our souls and sanctify our lives. Would you say amen out there? But you see, beloved, God had called them to do a specific job. And so God says, you're not going to do it in the flesh. You're going to do it with the supernatural gifts and the supernatural talents that I'm going to give you. God foresaw him as now being a mighty man of valor whom he had appointed and anointed. God now saw him as being brave and a deliverer of his oppressed people because the supernatural angel of the Lord was going to be with him. When you, God is with you, you and him make a majority. What did you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God foresaw him also as being a respected and feared judge in Israel who would personally be endowed with God's presence and his authority, and the Lord would be upon him, beloved. So he would be eminently qualified to do this, but not because he had training in these areas, but because God, when he comes upon us, through his spirit, opens up our minds, opens up our souls, opens up our spirits, and he downloads all that information, power, and uh, um, uh, equipment that we need to be able to do what he wants us to do for him. Amen? But you know, beloved, when God called him, listen to me now, Gideon had to say yes to God, and so don't you when God calls you. God does not force us to serve him. God calls us, God equips us, but we must all volunteer our services. We must say yes to God, beloved. And we must understand that even though we may feel terribly inadequate, nevertheless, God says you're not going to do this naturally. You're going to do this supernaturally. Would you say amen out there? You see, God is going to come upon you. You who are in Christ, beloved, you'll do it supernaturally through his spirit. And God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. That is a volitional and willing disposition of our hearts to respond with a resounding yes to his call and serve him whenever or wherever we're needed. And we can trust that he will indeed give us the ability to do the job that he's calling us to do. Amen? You see, beloved, God is not going to, uh, looking at our natural talents or education. People have said to me, I don't have enough education. You know what I've learned uh, I've got some education. Much learning doth make me mad. You know, you can get so much learning, you start questioning whether anything's true. <laughs> right? Especially as you're watching the news. You don't know if the politician's lying, the scientist is lying, the experts are lying, because everyone's contradict contradicting this person, that one's con How do you know? I'll tell you how you know. You go to prayer and God tells you. Amen? That's the only way you're going to know. You take in all that information and then you weigh it in the balance of your prayer and you say, God, show me. What's the truth in this? So I can obey your will. Would you say amen out there? So, but, beloved, what God is looking for is a servant with a ready mind and a willing spirit to serve him. God's not looking at you physically. He's not looking at your age <laughs> as a senior citizen. He's not looking at your age in the Lord. What he's looking at is that ready heart. Are you ready to serve me? Forget what it looks like. Forget what the odds are mustered against you. Don't look at that. Beloved, you are, as I go along, you'll see how, what kind of trouble that can get us in anyways. I want to know one thing. When I call you, are you willing to serve? Are you willing to step up to the plate and do what it is that I've asked you to do? I hope you can say amen, Lord, because God says he's entrusted us with a job. 
He wants us to labor with Him in the vineyard. Amen? Oh, hear me now. God wants us to do extraordinary things through ordinary people just like you and I. I never in my life thought I'd ever be a pastor, be a preacher, but yet God said, Joel, this is my gift. You'll never be happy till you do what I want you to do anyways. That's why I did so many other <laughs> things, I guess. I was searching for God in all the wrong places. So that was point number one. God uses mainly common people. Number two, God uses a cleansed or clean people. I want you to look at Judges 6.25 through 27. And it came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old. That was a prized possession, by the way. That was like taking your main tractor. Okay, because that's how they, it was an agrarian society. And throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Now, Baal, of course, was the false god of the Midianites, the Malachites, the Philistines. But, beloved, the children of Israel worshiped the true God, but they mixed this Baalism, this, this heathen pagan religion in with it. That was called syncretism. They just mixed it together. And they said, well, God won't mind that because we're going to do it our way. God says, you worship my way, no way or the highway. Amen. He's revealed how he wants to be worshipped in the Word of God. So praise the Lord. He says, and cut down that grove that is by it. Now a grove was a little patch of ground where there were a bunch of totem poles in it. Carved of different gods that were uh, the Midianites, lesser gods than Baal that they would worship. He says, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. He's not only going to cut down, that's your beloved. He's not only going to fight the Midianites, he's getting everybody mad at him. He's cutting down the images of their God and burning them. <laughs> All right. To burn the sacrifices on the altar. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. Now, beloved, if we want God to powerfully use us like he did with Gideon, then we too, now listen to me, have to remove the idols from our life and cleanse our hearts and our lives from sin. We need to confess our sins. People make a big joke of sin today. Christians think because I've been born again, sin doesn't bother God anymore. Why is Christ in the heavenly sanctuary interceding for us then? Beloved, you listen to me. We need to confess our sins and be washed in the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can cleanse you from your sin. Not doing sacraments, not uh, going to masses, not saying novenas, not doing any of those things. Only the blood of the eternal Son of the living God is what can cleanse us from our sins. Amen? And, beloved, God had Gideon tear down his father's idolatrous altar of Baal in Israel and build an altar to the Lord and instead and offer burnt offerings on it. Why? To cleanse himself from sin. The Bible says the sins of the Father are in the Son to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I don't hate God, Pastor Joel, if you're not worshiping the true way. The Bible says you are. If you're unsaved, the Bible says you hate God. In fact, by the way, every unsaved person, including myself before I got saved, we all hated God. We love the God that we create. We love the God that lets us do whatever we want to do. But we don't love the God of the Bible who revealed himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? So you say, I love God. I seek after God. You can't seek after God unless God is first sought after you, by the way. And he stirs you up and gives you the grace to be able to do it because salvation's of the Lord. But anyways, Gideon had to repent of his sins of idolatry before God would ever use him, beloved, and the same is likewise true of us. That's why John said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That word confess means to admit before God that you sinned. Agree with God. I did it, and I'm terribly sorry. Lord, I can't conquer this without your power, without your spirit, without your grace upon me. I need you to anoint me, Lord God, so I can forsake this and get beyond it. Would you say amen out there? You see, God warns the sinner and the impenitent believer. And God warns the backslider in Proverbs 28, 13, that he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh it 
shall have mercy with the Lord. Confess it and do what? Go out and do it again? No. He says, he who confesses it and he forsakes it, that person has mercy with the Lord. God will not give you what you do deserve for the consequences of your sins. That's what mercy uh, is. You see, beloved, many believers, and I mean many, and I've been in the ministry over four decades now, many believers have fallen into the sin of idolatry. They don't even know it. It's rampant in the church. You say, Pastor, are you kidding me? You, you don't know it? Beloved, if you read the scriptures, you ought to know it. You listen to me and I, and idols, anything we love more than God, anything we fear or serve or value more than God, anything that we let consume us more than God. Well, I don't do the Pastor Joel. How about the idol of your cell phone? You can't eat without it. You can't wake up without it. You can't go to bed without it. You can't drive down the street without it. If you gave half that time to God, you'd be a spiritual giant. You'd be saved. You'd be sanctified. You'd be cleaned up. You'd be used by God. It's become an idol. The new idol in America it used to be sports. Now it's the cell phone. How about sex? That's an idol that sits on the throne of people's heart. How about pleasure and worldliness? How about compromise in the church? How about people who want money and fame and fortune? It sits on the throne of their heart and they give God a token. Just a token of their allegiance or time in their life. You see, God won't use us if there's unconfessed, unrepented, unforsaken sin in our lives. And that's why James 4 8 says this, and he says this to Christians. He says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Well, but he's talking to Christians there. That's why he called them adulterers and adulteresses. You can't do that unless you're married to someone. Amen? And it amazes me how Christians blow right over these texts without ever finding out what they really mean. So James says this in James 1.8. He says, do you know that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways? A double-minded man. Christians, so many of them have become double-minded. You see, beloved, I'm going to ask you something. Do you have an idol on the throne of your heart? Is it your cell phone? Then repent of it. Maybe it's your TV. Then repent of it. Maybe it's your uh, Facebook page or your Instagram or your Twitter account, beloved, then repent of it. Whatever the idol, repent of it and get, or get rid of it. Get rid of that sin. Get rid of that bondage. God does not want to use anyone who is enslaved to things like that. Jesus said, if the Son of God shall set you free, then you're free. Indeed, are you free? Indeed, I ask you that this morning. You hear me. Listen to me now. Any form of idolatry is a gross violation of the first and second commandments of God's law. Thou shalt have not, not have any gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in the heaven above, and I won't quote the rest of you. You know what it is. You see, folks, what I'm saying, many believers are not called by God to serve him because of their unconfessed and their unrepented sins and their rampant double-mindedness in their life. In other words, one day they want to get right with God. I want to rededicate myself to God. How many times have you seen that in this church and other churches? I'm coming forward to rededicate my life to God. Two days later, they're back doing the same thing they did. Can't make up their mind. One day they want to serve God, and then they find out, wait a minute, to serve God takes sacrifice? It takes time? Uh-huh. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And so they change their mind. You see, one day, beloved, they say, I'm going to repent. I'm truly going to repent. I'm going to change my life. I've had it with this sin. It's driving me nuts. But then that sin comes a knocking. Comes knocking just like in Cain's life. The sin lieth at your door, the door of your heart, and you let it in and you go back and you do the same thing because you can't make up your mind. You know, in Isaiah the prophet's day, in Isaiah 52, 21, uh, 11, God said to the children of Israel who are unclean, who are double-minded like James is talking about here. He says, Isaiah, I want you to go to them, and this is what I want you to say to them. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from hence. And he says, touch no unclean thing. And that Passage of Scripture is quoted by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18 in the New Testament. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know what I'm talking about. 
And he quotes that passage of Scripture. You see, beloved, God wants his servants to be clean morally and spiritually. He wants them to be clean physically in their lives, having clean lives, upright lives, decent lives, so they can testify to the Lord Jesus. And God wants you to have a clean life personally. That you're blameless, not sinless, beloved, blameless. You've got no moral sin. Nobody can accuse you of being a drunk or a drug addict because you're living uh, for, for the Lord. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, God says to his idolatrous and, uns and unseparated and unequally yoked people in the New Testament Israel who allow themselves to be defiled by the world in sin. Listen to what he says. And he's quoting here from Leviticus, by the way. Paul's quoting from the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. He says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, uh, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord. Is the world an unclean thing? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If a man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It says in 1 John 2.15, no, I'm not talking about the world of creation. I'm talking about this evil world system. You've got to really have some discernment before you dive in or jump in with both feet. Would you say amen? amen? Remember, beloved, whether you believe it or not, nobody can disprove this book, and I've tried to. That's how I got saved. Archaeologically, scientifically, historically, the most proven fact of history is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And any lawyer that's tried to disprove it has gotten saved because it meets all the rules of evidence. So if you don't believe that you're going to answer to God, you just don't believe it. Two and two is four, whether you believe it or not. You will someday. Then you'll believe, amen? You will believe. You see, folks, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, as Gideon was used, uh, used uh, uh, as a regular person, God used him because he was not extraordinary. Gideon had to put it all on the line. If he was going to be used by God, he had to clean up his life. And that's what we need to do. We need to submit and surrender our hearts and our lives to his lordship and serve him, beloved. These are the type, the plain, old, ordinary type of people and folks that God uses and does amazing things in and with and through. Would you say amen? We're but the instrument, God working in us, with us, through us. Would you say amen? You see, beloved... What am I saying to you? I'm saying we need to let God sit as king on the throne of our hearts. We need to let him rule and reign over our lives. Not our will, but thy will be done in our life. And then we'll be used like Gideon. Jesus said to the Jews of his day who said that they were the children of Abraham and the children of God. He said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I ask? You're hypocrites. You never intend to be what you pretend to be. That's what a hypocrite is. He's a play actor. Hypocrites is the Greek word. That's what it means. And so, beloved, God uses common people. God uses cleansed people. Number three, God uses courageous people. I want you to look at Judges chapter 6, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, Gideon, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Notice call, God called Gideon a mighty man of valor. Gibor Kael. That is, a man of great strength and courage, a man of great power and bravery, a man of great force, a man of great gallantry and fearlessness is what that Greek, uh, Hebrew word means. Now, why in the world did God ever call Gideon that when he hadn't yet done anything to even merit that? So, heretofore, he was a chicken-living little Jew. <laughs> okay. And yet says, thou mighty man of valor. I can see Gideon saying, who, he, who are you speaking to? <laughs> Don't have a Gideon around here? Uh, I, I can't tell. You see, folks, why did God do that? Because God saw him how he would be when the Spirit would come upon him and not how he was right then in the flesh. And that's the way God wants to look at us. That's why God has given unto us his most precious gift outside of salvation, the Holy Spirit of the living God. Amen. God has given us the gift of his Holy Spirit to dwell us in our bodies, our temple. See, God didn't see Gideon in the flesh. He knew that in the flesh, Gideon would be afraid. He'd be cowardly. In the flesh, Gideon would be scared. In the flesh, I'll say it like John Wayne, he'd be yellow. 
Okay. In the flesh, this man would be yellow. In other words, beloved, in the spirit, though, he'd be anointed, he'd be accompanied by the angel of the Lord, and now he'd be a spiritual and an unstoppable dynamo and warrior and force to be reckoned with. And so won't we when the Lord anoints and accompanies us in the spirit. Amen? You know, the Bible says now we're more than conquerors, now that we're in Christ. The Bible says that now, beloved, he always causes us to triumph in Christ. In Isaiah 56, uh, 54, 17, he says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Come on and say amen out there. You know, beloved, in Judges chapter 7, Verses 2 and 3, we see that after Gideon gathered an army of 32,000, God told him to have the men who were afraid to fight to go back home. God cannot and will not use us if we're cowards. Because fear and cowardice, beloved, is as infectious as a virus ever is. You hear me. It can quickly spread through the ranks of an army. It can quickly spread through the ranks of a family or a business or even a church. And it can spread like wildfire and it can demoralize and deter and paralyze all the people infected by it and stop them from doing what they should do, what they must do, and what they need to do because now they're too afraid to do it. I saw that in combat when I was in Vietnam. And people, they're talking big things, you know. The guys that I was with, they would make Rambo look like a punk. I'm telling you, beloved, that's just the reality of it. They make them look like a punk. They're not doing something behind the camera. You're watching these men that are really fighting, and I won't go into it. But uh, we we get so enamored with things that are not true that it amazes me sometimes. What am I saying to you? I'm saying fear and cowardice is catchy. It's contagious. It's communicable. So I want you to beware of fearful and cowardly people in the midst of your life, beloved, because you can catch their spirit. Somebody starts saying, you know what's going to happen if you do that? And you do this. You did that with the masks and the virus, and you get you so afraid, you know, you're coming and going. See, oh, the media knows how to manipulate most people anyways. You know, I told you, I told you, you cannot ever threaten me with heaven. If I die from the virus, I go to glory. And I can't go one second more than God allowed it or sent it. Now, Lord, I don't have any death wish. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's... I want to stick around a few more years. I mean, being 35 and going to heaven is good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Beloved, you hear me now. Courage. Now listen to me. Because a lot of people say, Pastor, I wish I had courage. I wish I was like you. You're not afraid. I'm not, huh? I, especially as you get older and get weaker, Beloved, you get more and more afraid. Believe me, when you're, when you're young and tougher than woodpecker, you think you can do anything. But as you get older, you're going to see. But courage is not the absence of fear, but it's the control of fear. It is the overcoming of it to do what needs to be done in spite of your fear. Heroes are scared people who learn to control and overcome their fear and do the job that needs to be done to help people or for the welfare of others. That's what a true hero is. He's not someone that's born with this courage, this bravado, and he just goes out and says, I'm going to do it, and it doesn't bother me a bit. Beloved, I, I hate to use myself as an example. Being a combat veteran, anybody that tells you they're not afraid in combat, they're lying to you. Now, some people can hide their fear better than others. And once you get into it, it's like a football game. After the battle, after the incoming, after the firefight, after the whole thing, then you see them all uh, uh, afterwards because you're so full of adrenaline, you're spitting it out. It's like lime or lemon juice in your mouth. So it's, uh, you know, we, we look at heroes and that this guy's just got something up on us. You know, he's got control over his fear. And that's what Gideon had to get, amen? And that's what we need to get, beloved. So what I'm saying, I'm saying heroes put aside their fear and they step up to the plate and they do things that we wouldn't, uh, the ordinary person doesn't do. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 8, if you go back there, look it up this afternoon. I always say, check me out. God told the officers in Israel's army to ask this question to the soldiers who were getting ready to go into war and into battle. He says, I want you to stand before them. And Moses asked him this question. 
What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest the brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. When that happens, beloved, the battle is lost even before it got started. You see, God says to the fearful, go home, you chickens. Get out of here, you yellow bellies. Leave like a frightened dog with a tail between your legs before you impact others with cowardice, and the battle's over before it begins. But look, beloved, there's nothing wrong with normal fear or self-surviving fear, uh, a protective fear, beloved. That's only human. But as Christians in the service of the Lord, 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Come on and say amen out there. Be able to think it through and know that if this is what God has called me to do, then I'm either going to do it and get it done or I'll die trying. And I'll be in the presence of the living God. You see, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He'll give you the assurance that God can and will use you. And now He'll uh, fill you with such abnormally uh, power, beloved, and courage and bravado that you'll do that. You'll step out. When we started this church, beloved, in my living room, I wanted to go to Virginia, and I had all these different plans, but God says, you're going to stay here, Joel. We were in the midst of a spiritual battle and all the things that transpired, but yet God says, this is where you're going to stay. And little by little, you had to trust him every step of the way. He didn't show me the end that this building was going to be here, whatever. We had to work our way through it, taking the lumps along the way. Amen. And so God will use you, beloved. You listen to me carefully now. The predicted great and final apostasy of the last days is now upon us, and many in the church are falling away from the faith. They're saying, Pastor, there's so many people say they believe in Jesus. Yeah, and I believe I'm a cowboy too, but I, I'm not. There's more than saying you're a Christian than just saying I, I'm a Christian. Some are falling away because they're backsliders and they love the world so much. They're still professing with their mouths, I love you, Jesus, but they're still in the world. Some are falling away because they compromise their convictions because they have no fear of God whatsoever. Beloved, we believe the promises of God, but we don't want to believe his threats, his threats of punishment. What's wrong with us? And some are falling away because they fear the attacks and the persecution from the enemy, so they cowardly refuse to stand up and earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. And that's why God says to you, why are you calling me your Lord when you won't ever do what I tell you to do? You're lying to yourself, you're trying to lie to me, and you can't mock me, you know that. Galatians 6, 7 through 9, I won't quote it to you. In the book of the Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, verses 7 and 8, Jesus deals with both the fearful and the faithful in the church like this before he returns. In verse 7, he promises the faithful. He says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, saith the Lord. Amen. But, beloved, conversely, in verse 8, he warns, But the fearful, the unbelieving in the church, will have their part in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. So what are you saying to me, preacher? I'm saying be courageous like Gideon. I'm saying why? Because God uses brave and courageous people, beloved. Those who are willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. Would you say amen? Willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. Not just go along. To get along. Number four, God uses common people. God uses cleansed people. God uses courageous people. Number four, God uses a cautious people. I want you to go to chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, they shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth of the water uh, uh, with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people, those 32,000, 
people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. In other words, they stuck their head right in the water. And the Lord said unto him, Gideon, by these 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And all the other people, let them go home. Tell them to Didi, tell them to get out of here. You see, beloved, there must always be a delicate balance between being courageous and being cautious, right? Being mindful and aware of all the particulars, all the potential dangers involved in the service you are about to undertake for the Lord is a good thing. Jesus said that we ought to count the cost. Now, there's a lot of times I'll put down a piece of paper, I'll put down pros and cons for doing something, and sometimes the cons far outweigh the pros, but nevertheless, I know that God wants me to do it, so I'm going to do it, regardless of oh, how many few uh, pros I may have on it. Amen? Because it's God's will that I do that. But being so overly cautious that you're afraid to do anything is a bad thing. Overly cautious people have very, very, very little faith. How do you know that, Pastor Joel? Because people without faith have to see the result first, then they step out and act. And a person who is overly cautious is saying, if I know what's going to happen, if I know the end result, then I'll go and do it. And that means you don't have very little faith in what God calls you to do. Amen? Sure, God wants us to pay close attention to the details. Sure, God wants us to pay close attention to all of the circumstances and people, beloved. He wants us to pay attention to the specifics. He wants us to count the potential, the potential cost of our actions. Why? So you can achieve your intended goals. But God does not want you ever to be so overly cautious that you are afraid to step out in faith and do something for him. I know what my mind tells me. I've been educated. I've been trained. But, but nothing, beloved. I'm glad you've been trained. I'm glad you've been educated. But if God says do it, do it. And obey what he has to say. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, you know all of life is a gamble. Everything you do is a gamble. When I was in business, I had to take a gamble. I borrowed money against my house, my insurance policy. It's a gamble. You get in your car, you're gambling that you're going to make it home. Right? Everything is a gamble in life. That's just the way it is. But you better gamble with the Lord on your side than not. <laughs> you see, beloved, while well, all the other 31,700 men in Gideon's army bent down to drink water, totally oblivious to the dangers surrounding them, only concerned with their own thr uh, thirst, they went down to the river, and there was the water, and there's uh, the surroundings and the trees. Could have been a thousand enemies out there and they put their head in the water <laughs> but there was 300 men that bent down and looked around they were lapping the water looking around checking their, checking their surroundings God says those are the men those are the men I'm going to use right there the rest of you go home I can't use you those 300 men those have the makings of a good warrior you're around, you're surrounding you. That's one of the first things they teach in the Marine Corps. Be aware of your surroundings. What's going on? Detail, detail. Amen. And so, beloved God, use them. And you know, Christ repeatedly told us to watch and be ready, didn't he? For example, he says to watch out for the tempter and temptations. First Peter 5, 8 and 9 says that be sober be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brethren that are within the world. So we're to be, not to be ignorant of Satan's devices, the wiles of the devil. We should be aware of that in our life. We're Christians. We're warned about that. And Christ tells us to watch out for the signs of the times. These were the sons of Issachar, remember, in that day. Beloved, with the, the, the Issachar, they were able to understand exactly what was going on. And so God said to them, they understand the signs of the times. These are the ones I'm going to use. And beloved, we're to watch out for all the precursory signs that will anoint, uh, announce the coming of the Lord. And they're everywhere right now. And Jesus said this in Luke 21, 36. He says, watch ye therefore. And pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So God uses 
cautious people, beloved, who pay close attention to the job he's called them to do, and they do it in spite of the odds that may be stacked against them. In other words, God wants us to be cautious, but yet courageous. God wants us to be prudent, yet willing to take chances. God wants us to be alert, yet be aggressive when we finally say, you know what, I'm going to do it, and no one is going to stop me. Until the Lord himself stays his hand. And lastly, let me close with this in my last five minutes. Number five, God uses confident people. God uses common people, cleansed people, courageous people, cautious people. And lastly, God uses confident people. I want you to look at chapter 7 again. And we're going to look at verses 12 through 15. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the uh, east, those are the termites, the uh, cellulites, <laughs> all the other ites, along in the valley, like grasshoppers in multitude. And the camels were without number as the sand by the sea for multitude. The camels were the tanks of those days. So here's the Gideon and his 300 peeking over the top of the hill, and there's row after row of camel tanks. And the people like grasshoppers, millions, I mean millions, hundreds of thousands, okay? Down in the valley, and you're 300. Kidding, are you sure about this? <laughs> That's what I say. Charge, you first. <laughs> I'll follow you. <laughs> All right, that's what I would have said to him. Oh, where am I? Uh, so anyways, beloved, in, in verse 15, it says, 14, and his fellow answered and said, no, let me back up to verse 13, right? Stop arguing with me. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. Now, barley bread in that day, barley was cheap grain. It was like white, 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 white rice. <laughs> okay. People loved making oat bread and wheat bread, but barley bread, only the, that was the inferior grain, not the superior grain. And they saw this inferior barley loaf run down the hill and kill all these Midianites. And, and smote it and fell and overturned that the tent lay long. Verse 14. And his fellow, his fellow answered and said, I'll tell you what the interpretation of this is. He said, this is nothing else but save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream. And interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Now, beloved, the Malachites and the Midianites had a huge army compared to Gideon's small 300 men. But Gideon snuck up into their ta down into their valley that night. This was a special op operation, okay? So he sneaks down, and when he does, he hears these two guys talking. You know what? There was this barley loaf that ran down the hill, and it came down to kill. You know what that is? Gonna, we're going to get killed. It's going to kill us all. And he's nothing but an inferior barley loaf. Imagine if God ever makes him a wheat loaf. <laughs> or is that meat loaf? One or the other. But anyways, imagine if God ever does that. Boy, I'll tell you, we wouldn't have a chance. Gideon says, arise, charge, and conquer your enemy right now with the Lord. The angel of the Lord is with us. Would you say amen out there? So this gave Gideon confidence of victory and caused him to trust God for deliverance. And it ought to us too, beloved. You know, our names should be known in the camp of the devil and demons in hell the same way Gideon's name was known in the enemy's camp and terrified by it. Beloved, I'd be proud to know that the devils in hell feel threatened when they hear the name of Pastor Joel. I'd be proud. How about you? I'm afraid of you know, the seven sons of Sceva. Well, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you? I hope they could say, I, I, I know you too. That's like I know Paul. I could say that. How about you? So, beloved, confident people know that they have the victory over sin. And they know that they have the victory over self and Satan. Satan can't force us to do anything against our will, beloved. And we know Confident people have victory over this evil world system. And ultimately, someday, the Bible says, we'll have victory over death, hell, and the grave. Confident people get the job done for the Lord. Would you say amen? 
I've said this to you a thousand times. I want to say it one more time. My dad always said to me, he said, Hawk, he used to call me the Hawk, because I come in all hours of the night, all circling. You got a job that needs to be done? Yes, Dad. Busy man to do it. He knows how to do it. Get someone who knows how to get things done. I don't care if he's, good. he's busy than a one army, a paper hanger in a wind tunnel, the seven-year rich. Give it to him. He'll find a way to get it done. So my question to you this morning, beloved, is are you one of the people God uses? Do you want to be one of the people God uses? You say, uh-huh, preacher, I want to be. Well, good, because he uses common people, and you're probably the common people. Not too many of us here have royal blood, except if you're a Christian. Amen? And God uses cleansed people, so you've got to clean up your life. And, beloved, we see God uses courageous people, people who are trying to get a handle on their fear so they can be courageous. They can overcome it. They can control it. And God uses cautious people, people who will think things through, but who are not overly cautious. And lastly, beloved, God uses a confident people. Not confident in ourselves. We're confident in the Lord. Confident that the living God who dwells within us will lead us and guide us and enable and empower us and equip us to do the job. Amen. The people God uses, are you one? Are you one? Are you one?